It's been a long road since the original kicker christened that first pickup truck. It kicked off a car audio renaissance, and upgrading your music in a vehicle was a requirement. America's Music Machine became live and loud with your passion, your emotion, your existence. Outdoors or on the open road, your sound is kicker. Simon. Are you ready? <laughs> 22. Me, me, me. We're doing it one more time. We're going to do another one. We're going to do this right this yeah. time. Weeka, weeka, weeka. Yeah. Check. I'm speedless. speedless. Camera adds 27 pounds. Okay. It just seems like a, a, a I know, rough it's, it's, it's just it's kind of, yeah. This is Dave. And Kip. Come check us out. out. This is Kip. And Dave. And I got it wrong again. And we're going to have to do this again because we went on a different trail. <laughs> Until then, this is Dave. And Kip. Come check us out. C -c Come check us out. Yeah. Wiki, 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 wiki. I think that's good. <laughs> just pick one. God, I hate the ending. There's no way to yeah. end this. Just say, come see us. Come, Just come see us. And just come see us. So. Come see us at the, ex come see us at the two locations. God, I, it just seems so hard. <laughs> Delmar Hogwall up here, coming to you from outside Mildred's Bait Shop in Lingerie. I want to appreciate you all coming, giving a look-see in on the Kicker Unmasked show. Those folks at Kicker, salt to the earth, make some of the finest gear ever tickle your ear. So, mighty fine of you to come take some time off and check them out. And remember, whether you're looking for night crawlers or nighties, Mildred's is your place. So once again, thank hey, what? Hey, son, put down that armadillo and get some pants on. Oh, my Lord, kids. Music is my passion, my livelihood, and it's in my DNA. My pals at Kicker Marine Audio gave me a chance to take the music, what I love and listen to, at home, on stage, and in the car, onto the water. Hi, this is Jason Bonham, and I want to say a big thank you to my friends at Kicker Audio for inspiring the songs and the stories behind the music that inspires America. Go overboard! The Kicker Quad Box is the most insane, ground-pounding, basshead-loving, preloaded subwoofer enclosure we have ever offered. It consists of four L7R 12-inch subwoofers. It has a total power handling of 2,400 watts RMS, and it's tuned at an amazing 31 hertz. Here to tell us more about it is Kicker's very own Jeremy Brown. Hi, my name is Jeremy Brown. I've been with Kicker for 22 years. I work in the research and development department. In the early 2000s, I would run the Gates Bronco at shows like Daytona. We would do hair tricks, 48 10-inch subwoofers with 48 1,000-watt amplifiers. Really big build back in that day. 
we were able to develop some high output enclosures that were up above the 170 dB mark. We set a few world records with some of those enclosure designs and our woofers. We learned a lot about high output enclosure designs during that time, and we've been able to bring that to our product lines today. Within the last year, we introduced a new subwoofer enclosure with four L7R12s that we call the Quad Box. Our Quad Box is built out of three quarter inch birch. It's got a one and a half inch baffle and a one and a half inch bottom. We also use window frame bracing along with corner bracing to make the enclosure more rigid. We use a flared port to reduce port noise and increase port surface area. This type of vent design helps maximize output. We use the L7R 12 inch subwoofers because this allows you to use one KXA 2400.1 amplifier and you still get big bass with fewer upgrades to your charging system. The Kicker Quad Box is the bass head starter kit. And if you're worried, it plays way below 40 hertz. Do not attempt to adjust this transmission. We have assumed control. The year is 1980. Music fights for its very survival in an acoustically desolate wasteland man calls automobile. Enter Steve Irby, a man whose love of music helped end this scourge forever and forge a path for modern car audio to follow. A humble musician with a passion for quality sound, Mr. Irby is a man who feels it is his destiny to provide a sanctuary for mobile audio. Welcome. Join us this evening as we venture back to the very night a young Steve Irby gains his inspiration to create the legacy we know today as Kicker Performance Audio. Though he does not realize it now, by this time tomorrow, Mr. Irby will have completed blueprints for the original kicker and champion the war against mobile audio inequality. Tonight, Mr. Irby's prayers will be answered as he begins his quest into the Q zone. Kicker L7QB8. With roots dating back to Kicker's inception, Mr. Irby and his team of engineers have achieved an unrivaled level of design and functionality. With extraordinary base and a minimal footprint, the L7QB8 utilizes a seamless quarter inch extruded aluminum housing, allowing optimal internal air volume for the subwoofer. This exclusive design provides exceptional strength and stability. Like the original kicker, the L7QB8 incorporates a unique passive radiator to minimize required airspace while optimizing the efficiency and frequency response of the subwoofer. Opposite the passive radiator, the L7QB8 is equipped with the all new eight inch L7 square subwoofer. The 2016 L7 features an aluminum basket for exceptional strength and thinned aluminum heat sinks for efficient heat dissipation. Kicker's blue lace spire, solo cone 360 degree back bracing, and a laser etched comb brace combine as a single ultra rigid unit. The result is increased clarity, higher volume, and added reliability. The square cone features over 20% more surface area than round subwoofers. It's attached to a Santa Prince surround, then stitched to the cone for long life and durability. This surround features Kicker's patented rib corners, which fully dictates cone motion and extends surround life. 
At the base of the unit, a pair of custom form flanges integrate seamlessly with an extremely low profile mounting system, consisting simply of a mounting plate and bar. Once installed, the overall height of the enclosure is only nine and a half inches. This profile is small enough to work perfectly in countless trucks, sedans, and SUVs. Once again, Kicker sets a new standard with the groundbreaking design and unparalleled performance of the all-new L7 QB8. This is where Kicker started, right here, in this garage right back here. It was a great place, but just a little bit small. And uh, after about six months, actually, we got kicked out of here. My wife said there's entirely too much sawdust uh, seeping into the house from the garage. But uh, this was the beginning right here in the garage on 1412 Eastern Street in this little house. Okay, here we are at Kicker location number two down on South Main Street in Stillwater, Oklahoma. And this is the little house that we moved into after we got kicked out of the garage. Here we are, kicker location number three. We spent about seven or eight years in this place. We moved from the little house right over here into the Quantanet when we ran out of space. We had about 35 employees. Here we are, kicker location number four. This is up on top of a hill. It's a little bit windy here. But we spent the years from 1989 until about 2006 here, until we moved into our new facility.
Good evening, everyone. It's 730 Central Time. Kicker Unmasked Live Weekly is the event. Thanks for tuning in. Welcome to Stillwater, Oklahoma, the home of Stillwater Designs and Audio. For as everyone out there knows, this is Kicker. Thanks for tuning in. We've had a great night tonight. If this is your first time tuning into the show, thank you for taking the time to join us. Hope you stick around. We're going to have a lot of fun. we got some great dyno tests. we got some fun we're going to get into. Hopefully you'll stick around for that. If this is a return, you know what goes on. You know what started at 715. It's the contest we do every night. So for those of you who are new to the feed, you'll notice scrolling across the bottom of the screen, there's actually a link. It's kicker.fun, and tonight it's forward slash dyno500. And so that is a link to enter a contest. We kick that off right at 7.15. We run it until 8.30. And when I'm talking times, remember, I'm always talking central time here. So if you're on the east coast or west coast, adjust for your time zone. But when we kick this off at 7.15, we're going to run it right up until 8.30. At 8.30, we stop the contest. We're going to draw three winners, and we will announce the winners tonight before we close the show out. We try to keep the show right at about 9 o'clock. So that's our time frame we try to run in tonight. Third place and second place, you guys know what you're in for. A set of EB300 wireless earbuds, a couple koozies, keep your drinks nice and chilled, and you're going to get one of these awesome Kicker Unmasked Live Weekly t-shirts that you see sitting over my shoulder. Now, our grand prize winner tonight, you're going to get the koozies and you're going to get the t-shirt, but you're going to get a key 500.1 amplifier. And it's actually one of the amplifiers we're going to dyno on the show live tonight. So you'll get to see what that amplifier does, and that's what the grand prize winner is going to walk away with tonight. So if this is your first time here, here between now and 8:30, kick that link enter we're going to ask you for your shirt size a little bit of information that'll get you entered into the contest everyone who's been here before you know the deal just enter that contest before 8:30. Good news is, you know, initially this was just open to the uh, U.S., the continental U.S. Uh, due to our good friends, Jemson, who's our distributor north of the border up in Canada, this contest is now open to all of our Canadian friends. So if you're tuning in from north of the border, thank you for tuning into the show. Be sure to enter the contest. We've actually had a couple Canadian winners, so it is possible to win. It'll take us a little bit longer to get your prize to you if you're a Canadian winner, uh, but you will get it. Our friends at Jemson work with us. We'll make sure you get that prize up across the border. So besides great beer, you got a chance to win a prize here on the Kicker Un mass live show so thanks for tuning in if you're coming from across the northern border the uh, other thing I want to bring up is we're going to have a cool live event coming up on a weekend uh, we're actually going to meet Steven Satano hope I'm saying his name correctly or maybe it's Satano uh, he's actually the winner of our MSE our mobile soundstage engineering giveaway that we get, did in conjunction with mr. Mark Eldridge over in Bixby Oklahoma or Bixby Oklahoma so he's going to come in on the 20th. He will be here for the 21st and 22nd, which is the day of the classes. That's over there with Mark at MSC. We're going to join them that Saturday morning, introduce ourselves to him, shoot some live footage uh, right from there, broadcast it live out. So if you're not subscribed to uh, the Kicker Facebook and YouTube channels, you might want to do that so you get the notifications, hit that bell uh, when we do these little live uh, short view videos at these special things like meeting the winner of the MSE contest you'll be able to get that notification and know we're going live so that's going to be on the 21st look out for that one and then along with that Stephen will be joining us here in the studio live that Tuesday which will be the 24th uh, Steve will be here we'll do a live broadcast show with him here in the studio and have him join us see what his thoughts on on MSE were see what he thinks about his tour here at kicker and you get to see how the show actually happens every Tuesday night because sometimes we don't know how it happens either but somehow it all comes together at the end and we get a show kicked off. So keep that in mind and uh, Stephen looking forward to meeting you on August 21st. The MSE winner uh, the training uh, got that okay we call this the housekeeping part of the show folks keep that in mind. 24,000 24, 24 oh that's no that's the 24 that's the date sorry I'm reading the wrong number. The 20,000 K giveaway so 20 K or 20,000 people giveaway. Folks we are really really close to getting to 20,000 subscribers on our YouTube channel. Uh, as a matter of fact, Ernie, would you bring my laptop as an asset if you don't mind? Pop that up on the screen. And if you'll notice, this is actually the Kicker YouTube page right here. And you'll see we're sitting right at about 19,700 subscribers, 19.7K. And if we will get to 20,000 subscribers, or I should say, when we get to 20,000 subscribers, we're going to kick off some kind of a big prize giveaway. We don't know what it will be. We haven't made up our minds yet. It might be a full car audio system. Could be some subs. Could be some amps. We don't even know yet. But we're going to base it on when we hit the 20,000 mark on our YouTube channel. So if you guys could do us a favor, if you could like and subscribe to the Kicker YouTube channel, 
The first thing that's going to do is it's going to get us to 20,000 faster. As soon as we get to that 20,000, we're going to kick off this new contest. What's it going to be? Don't know. Throw your ideas in the comment field. We'd love to know what you think you'd like to see in a contest like that. So if you haven't shared this yet with your friends who are into car audio, man, please do that. Let them know what we do here every Tuesday night, 730 Central Time here on the show. The drawings, the prizes, the fun, the trainings, the dinos, the guests we have come on. Please ask them to come join the channel because the sooner we hit that 20,000 number, the sooner we're going to do a prize pack giveaway. And I know you guys are in for that stuff. So that's going to be pretty cool. You know, Ernie, also, besides the giveaway, uh, could we go back to my screen for just a quick second? And what I want to show here is Bill, you know, the last few shows we've actually brought up a web page and gone to each web page to show you the events where Kicker is out in the field. And what Bill has done, thanks to Bill Frog, he's actually set that up on the Kicker Facebook main page under events. And if you go to this page, you will see all the upcoming events that Kicker is going to be at, whether it's a consumer oriented event, or in some cases it may be an event that's not on the page, which you'll see to be like Knowledge Fest Dallas, which is a trade uh, centered event. So right now, actually, the uh, today, uh, Jeremy is actually out at the Dune Fest out in uh, Oregon. And so that event's going on right now. He's out in the field. But then you'll see coming up, we've got Outlaw Armageddon. That's going to be down in Thunder Valley Raceway Park in Noble, Oklahoma. Audio Midwest, Team Bone Crusher, and Base, Base Wars. Base. I'm going to come back to that in a second. Base Wars. And then we got Cruise in Oklahoma. That's an event that's actually going to happen here at Stillwater Designs. Actually, it's going to be a cruise in, a bunch of people with really cool classic cars, custom cars. We're going to have a cruise in and meet at the Kicker facility. Uh, then Ocean City Jeep Week, that'll be up uh, following that. Knowledge Fest in Dallas, if you're in the trade, we'd love to see you there. That's going to be down in Dallas, Texas. Sand Sports Super, Sand Sports Super Show, that's going to be in OC, Orange County, California. And then last but not least, this is one that we uh, haven't even talked about yet, the Showdown. Uh, it's a huge event. I almost want to, uh, without trying to steal anything from the name I want to call it, this is almost like the, uh, the slamology of the West Coast. Uh, this is being put on by our good friend Steve Barber over at Chartin on him. And he is doing the great Las Vegas Taco Festival. I heard Ernie snickering. I'm going to laugh if he doesn't stop snickering. Um, so the showdown, we are actually the title sponsor for that, that event as well. A lot of us will be there at that event. Great music, great food, great cars, uh, cardio competitions going on, SPL contest, the whole nine yards. That's going to be happening. Uh, it's the weekend after SEMA. Um, so it's going to be the, I think it's the November 6th. Yeah, it is November 6th. I'm just looking at the screen here. So. Now it would be easier for you guys, if you want to know what events uh, are coming up for Kicker as far as on our events calendar, please go to the Kicker Facebook page, look under events, and we will keep all those updated courtesy of Bill Frog. And Bill Frog, thank you very much for doing that. We appreciate it. Now, Base Wars. Base Wars. Who, who runs that organization? Do you know, Ernie? A guy. There is a guy that runs Base Wars. What's his name? Have you got a camera you could throw on him? I think I do. Let's throw a camera on this guy because this guy, he calls me out of the blue. It's kind of dark back there, but there he is. I see him back there with you in the studio, Ernie. But Mr. Billy Temple, give me a wave there, man. Give a wave to the camera. For those of you out there that know Base Wars, uh, Base Wars is one of the organizations out there, and Kicker is uh, one of his uh, main sponsors for the organization. They do a lot of great things out there, a lot of great competitions going on all across the country. He's expanding, he's in lots of areas. And Billy called, and so he was lucky enough to get to join us for dinner tonight. Or I should say, I think he planned it so he could get a free steak on us because we went to Texas Roadhouse tonight, and that was courtesies. <laughs> he ain't the only one. Well, well, who else joined us tonight, Ernie? Bring him up too. Come on. Where's he? There he is. It's Mr. Brad Gans. And Mr. Brad Gans is actually one of our regional sales managers. And he's actually joining us this week. And he asked if he could come down and join us in the studio. And we said, sure, come on down. So Brad joined us for dinner. So we got Brad back there in the studio tonight. We've got uh, Billy Temple from Base Wars. He's back there seeing how things happen. And we got the normal crew. Ernie's back there. Bill Frog's back there, Tim's behind the cameras, but since JW is out at Dune Fest, we got everybody's call out gal, Sandy. Give a wave, there she is. How you doing, Sandy? 
So Sandy is actually taking the place of Mr. JW tonight, helping us keep things going on StreamYard and looking at comments. So with that said, everyone, thank you very much. You know, tonight's special guest, and we're going to get to him in just a minute, uh, is actually going to be Mr. Derek Williston, Big D himself from Williston Audio Labs, because tonight's topic is amp dynos. And we're going to have an open conversation, discussion about what they do, how they work. We've actually got some live amp dyno set up here at Kicker. We're going to show you here on the table. And since it's live, folks, you never know what's going to happen. If you've seen some of the amp dynos we've done before, you know it's, it's an open field here. We may blow up an amp. You never know. Uh, we take amp dynos a little more seriously, I think, than some people do. We run them just a shade longer. At least that's the impression I get when I talk to Derek. Um, but we're going to do some live amp dynos here. And then we're going to have a discussion about the other aspects of an amplifier that you could get into that you can't measure with an amp dyno. But so how do we do it? And we're going to talk about that when we get to that here in just a second. With that said, are there any comments like throw up on the screen tonight, Sandy? I know you've been back there busy. Who do we got joining us here tonight? I see Jerome. Kip just got off ready for the show. Hey, Jerome, good to see you, man. I see you right there. Boom. Thanks for joining us here on the show, Jerome. We certainly appreciate it. I see Deviant for Life. He's always in here. He knows the show's rigged. When it comes to winning contests, he doesn't win a thing. Uh, SMD scoot in the house. I want to win, Sandy. I see that coming up here. Love my EB400s. My wife loves the EB300s. I won right here. Hey, Brad McCracken. I'll bring that up here real fast. Thanks for tuning in. I hope you're having a good evening tonight, Brad. Uh, glad you're loving the products. Uh, you know, that's one of the things. Hey, good friend. Got a shout out to him. Jimmy Pittman. How you doing, Jimmy? Good to see you in the feed, man. Um, Brad, thanks for that. You know, we really like the, the prize we give away here because, you know, a lot of times it is kicker product. It gives you a chance that maybe you didn't know we made earbuds or headphones or bullfrogs or those other type of products. Gets you a chance to try it. We know if you try it, you're going to like it and you're going to let your friends and family know. So thanks for that shout out. Uh, share that with everyone you know. People's looking to get a pair. Send them to any kicker dealer. You can come straight to kicker.com. Love to get them in all your friends and family's hands. Uh, we'd all like to win, Sandy. Mead, 916. Hey, Steve, I'm here editing video and watching you. Mr. Steve Mead himself. Sir, thanks for tuning in tonight. We appreciate it. Tony, petition. To, what was that? I didn't see it. You took it away too fast. Grumpy Doss in the house. Tease, ter Terrace, Tease, Myrna, Pony. Petition to give away a Lego Porsche for Deviant's Beardy. <laughs> that would be interesting, I think. Um, looking here. He's a, you forgot, whoa, go back. I got to get that one there. Petition to give away a leaguey grumpy in the house. 25 hertz to life. Kip, you forgot Young Buck. He's a good co-host. You know, Young Buck himself, that would be Chase Alexander. And he did join us on the show last week. We were talking about employees' cars, and he was actually one of the cars we brought in. And Chase is a very enthusiastic young man. He's definitely uh, a, a shining example of someone who's enthusiastic. He loves his job here. Uh, he's learning lots of things in the back there with the more seasoned guys, but uh, he is doing a fantastic job. So uh, glad to see him here. Michael Mead or Michelle Mead. Mrs. Mead upstairs from Mr. Mead. So we have Mrs. Mead upstairs from Mr. Mead joining us. Michelle, thank you for joining us tonight. Good to see you in here. The uh, new comments, Kip, you forgot Young Buck. I see that one there. Any other, Sandy? oh man, there's lots of shout outs here for Sandy. I think we need to get Sandy out here on a microphone. I think she could take care of this. Oh, I've got to get this one here. How you doing tonight, Scott? Good to see you. Scott from Powerhog Audio. I've decided two comp Q10s and a band pass with a pair of QS 6.75 components per door. Baseaholics Designs. Ah, Drew Jones must be working with you on that one, Scott. Good to see you do that. Uh, I think you're going to really like those drivers. Most people who try the comp cues, they're never disappointed. And those uh, QS components, very underrated. People don't understand just the sound quality that you get out of those and how good they sound. So that's awesome. Another comment from Mr. Mead. I'm downstairs in my office editing. She is schlepping on the couch. It may not be schlepping for long with comments like that. We better not show those anymore. So, oh, here, here's a good one. Jesse Strawn. Scott, what power are you going with? Well, that's a good question, Jesse. It's probably on everyone's mind. We'd probably find out. If Scott will post it. We'll put it up here in the feed. Uh, Joshua Jacobs asked a question. Do you guys run epicenters? I can tell you in, in my past, uh, I've run a few epicenters in my own vehicles. The funny thing about epicenters, I've probably owned about half a dozen of them. I buy one, I use it for a while, I decide I don't want it, I sell it off to a buddy, and then I go down a little bit further down the highway and I decide I want another one. So I've owned quite a few epicenters in my lifetime. I actually drove to a store, and this was back when I was much younger, um, I actually drove to a store that was about two and a half hours away to buy my very first epicenter and I wanted for my car. So I know what it's like to want one of those. Tompkins Adelaide. Hi from Tompkins Car Audio in South Australia. Whoa, 
Thanks for tuning in, man. That is clear around the other side of the planet. Good to see you here coming in tonight. Uh, I will be great. Do what? Well, hey, Ernie wants to know what time it is there. If you got the time, post it up in the comments. I'll get that post up here. I have no idea what time it is. It's got to be, what, t 10 hours and tomorrow? Probably. Steve, here we go. <laughs> Zach Bauman, Steve Mead about to win that 500 watt amp. You never know, he just might. You know, the thing I know about Steve though, I'd be willing to bet if Steve Mead wins that amplifier, he'd probably turn around and give it away to somebody on one of his live feeds. I see him do stuff like that all the time. He's a cool dude. Um, Todd? 10 18 a.m.? 10 18 a.m. Well, thanks for tuning in. Good morning. I guess that be, wouldn't be a good evening from here. It'd be good morning to there. <laughs> Ernie, Ernie wants to cheat and know what the stocks are doing. Just ignore him. Todd Spraker, or Spracker, I hope Kicker will be able to keep up with all the L7 X orders that will be coming in soon. Lots of people are waiting for them. Todd, thank you for that. There are a lot of people waiting on that driver, and trust me, we are working as diligently as we can to get that product to market. Uh, we've talked about the realities on multiple shows here on Unmasked Live about what we're dealing with. It's not excuses. It's just the reality of what it is for anyone making anything in today's global economy right now. We're doing the best we can. We're excited to get those out. I know every uh, week or so we have listening tests on where we're doing changes or modification stuff and I'm excited for those drivers to come out. I think a couple L7Xs are going to find their way into my home theater. Uh, those are going to be awesome, awesome drivers. Uh, Thomas Marshall, I have a set of VT10s, pretty awesome subs for my single cab. You know, Thomas, I say this all the time every time I hear one and I even made the comment to Timmy after we had him and his truck on last week. Those comp drivers in those passive radiator boxes, so what he's got is the, 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 C, or the CWRTs, uh, the TRTP is the down firing. And I heard those in his truck, and as we're sitting there listening to it, man, every time I listen to those, I'm just like, man, these things sound amazing. Uh, and even the VT10s, you're right, they, they're a great sounding speaker. We make a lot of subwoofers. Each one has a unique purpose and it's unique design, so uh, we're gonna talk about that in a future show. It's gonna be fun. Uh, here, it's about Kicker, Thomas Marshall. Kip, what's up, Thomas? Good to see you, Mud. DV for Life. Do y'all have a, oh wait, here's James. I'm gonna bring this up. James, is that Coin maybe? Looks like James Coin Jr. Do you all have a basing semi demo big truck? James, yes we do. Uh, we have an XRV is what we call it. It's a stream yard. Uh, or, sorry, I'm just looking up at StreamYard and it just mo popped up a notification, but I'm sure Bill and Sandy will take care of it back there. But the, um, Bill and Sandy are back there working on that. We have what we call the XRV, and it is an 83-foot black semi-rig, kicker down the side of it, you can't miss it. But what's cool about it is in the front nose of that trailer section, we've got some cool displays in it where you can go in and look at kicker product and everything, but in the front section, we actually have what we call the mini boom room, and it's a mini version of what we have here at the main facility, which is 16 uh, square subwoofers up front here. We actually have 12 in the rig, and then we got the three pair of our big 11-inch marine cans, and we're running the whole thing on plenty of power. It sounds amazing. Uh, if you're ever out at an event where the XRV is located, you need to get in line because there's usually a line to get in and listen to it and check that thing out. It's a fantastic sounding rig. So yeah, check that out. Justin Kirby. Hello, my Kicker family. Justin, how you doing this evening? Good to see you, man. Thanks for tuning in. What's the best upgrade from the KS 6x9s and 4x6s? Mmm, best upgrade from KS. Right now, Chris, KS, as far as in a, like a 6x9 or a 4x6, uh, if you wanted to upgrade from there, you would want to look at the QS 6x9 uh, coax, and that would be the upgrade in a 6x9 component. When it comes to the 4x6s, I don't know if I'd call it an upgrade, but what I would tell you to do is if you're looking to do something for better sound up in the front of your vehicle like that, I'd really seriously wait until the new KSMT2504, which we call the nickname with the snowman pod, which is that uh, mid-range and tweeter on that fully adjustable pod. If you're looking for better SQ in the front of your car, that's a quick and easy way to get a really adjustable mid and tweet in the front of your vehicle to get better sound. I'd say look into that. So there's my answer. For that one. Hope you like that. Saber SMAW, small. If you want to see the original boom room, I have a video of it from 2018 Slamology. Yeah, that would actually be before we did the upgrade. If you have that, you ought to post it up, let people know where it's at there. I'll the, uh, probably throw it up on the Facebooks or the YouTubes. Let us know where it's at. We'd love to see it. David Bryant, Kip, y'all have a quest over there from Mississippi? <laughs> we do have a lot of people coming for that direction, don't we? Especially with Billy in the house. 
So it looks like there's a lot of people tuning in. A lot, man, there's a lot of people tuning in the feed. You guys are all in here. These shakes actually provide less cone area. They, they, I'm going to bring this one up real quick. A lot of people may or may not know. This is Mr. David Gamini, and he's tuning in from around the pond as well. He's over in, is it Thailand? Yep. That's what I thought. Dave is now, he retired. Uh, Dave worked for here at Kicker. He was uh, actually the guy in charge of our tech training department, and he's retired and moved over there with his wife into Thailand. And Dave says, that's been done. Those shapes actually provide less cone area. So Dave must be answering a question about other shapes besides square or round. Uh, good to see you tonight, Dave. Thanks for tuning in, man. Who do we have here? This is going to got to go tow someone that crashed. Got to go. Well, Jeff, thanks for tuning in as long as you could. I know that you do drive a tow truck for a living. Looks like you got some work to do. Get her done, son. We'll see you back here when you get a chance. Kicker, Baseology 101 at Kicker. Just seems to be a great personality difference. No hate, though, just an observation. Don't even know what that's talking about. You must be talking about stuff in the feed I'm not seeing there. So I'm just looking through here. Enough chit chat. Let's blow up some amps. Mike B, you want to blow some amps up? I hope we don't, but you never know. That's a possibility. So everyone, thanks for tuning in. We've got lots of comments on here. I can't keep up with all of them piling in here. I wish I could keep up with all of them. But with that said, we do have an interesting show tonight, and we couldn't have a discussion or a talk about amplifier or amplifier dynos without bringing in the legend, the guy who started it all. Uh, his channel is packed full of amplifier dynos, and he's testing amplifiers all the time, whether they're old school. And, you know, he kind of transitioned from that into the Williston Audio Labs, which does not just old school, but also new school stuff as well. And that would be Mr. Mr. himself, Big D, Derek Williston. I know he's down in the feed. Let's bring him up into the chat channel here. Derek, how you doing this evening? Hey, Kip. Hey, everybody from Kicker. <laughs> Good to see you guys tonight. Thanks for having me on here. It's very exciting to be part of this show. I do want to say real quick, uh, your intro to me was very kind, but I do want to give a shout out where shout outs are needed. Mr. Steve Mead is in the chat, which we've already seen. He was behind, along with Tony Demore, the uh, Amp Dinos. So they're the ones responsible for these tools that are available for all of us to use. So quick shout out to them for making these available for the average consumer so that we can find out what our amplifiers are doing. So just want to start with that. You know, and Derek, the one you held up there, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, that is the AMM1, is that correct? Just want to make sure I got the model there number correct. And this is actually the one that we're going to be using in the studio tonight is that small handheld unit. Now we've got one of the, the same one that you use on your channel, the great big box. Um, we have one of those as well back in the labs. We're not using it in studio tonight. We might pull it into the studio at a later date, but R&D uses that a lot, you know, to, to look at verification and validate and see what it says versus the readings we get on other gear we use here at the factory. So uh, that handheld, do you use that handheld a lot? I, know I do. I use, use both. Big box. And I, I can actually tell you there's some benefits to using this one over the big dyno. So we'll, we can talk about that when we get into, you know, what each one of them will do, some of the features. Um, I'll just go ahead and tell you, this one, sure. you can actually test the power going to your speakers. This one will do reactive loads as well as resistive loads. The big amp dyno will only do resistive loads that are built in, so you can't actually test the big amp dyno using speakers. This one you can, so this is really cool because you can hook it up in your system, run your speaker wire through here, play back your track, and you can see how much actual live power is going to your speaker. And I've shown that before where I've blown up a, a speaker, a small six and a half, to find out how much power it could take before the smoke came out. So <laughs> things like that. And Steve has shown this with a microwave, I believe, or Tony showed it with a microwave so you can see how much power your microwave is using. There's all kind of uses for this tool. It's really, really cool tool. It is a really cool tool, and that's the one we've got here in the studio that we're going to be using tonight. Uh, Adam C. chimed in here. I hope you get to dyno older kicker amps. You know, tonight we don't, we're not having any older kicker amps, but I'm sure we could do another show in the future. We might be able to pull a couple older kicker amplifiers and have what would be cool is if we reserve that for a time where maybe when Derek is actually here live and we do that stuff live here in the studio, maybe we do... I just, I don't think we can do a war horse. I know that's on your plate. I know that's on your agenda. You want to <laughs> dyno a war horse, but to do that, I think we'd have to not do it with this gear. We'd probably have to do it with some other gear and, and maybe an AP in a different setup because the way that amplifier works, it just won't test through this gear, at least not that I'm aware of. Now, maybe Tony or uh, Steve can chime in later on and let us know that maybe there is a way to do it, but I don't think there is. Yeah, I, I don't think so, Kib. I think it, it would have to be done with audio precision, but still, that would be fun, and yes, whenever uh, we can make that happen, Happen, I am there and we'll do it live. Sounds great to me. That sounds like a good time. So what we've got set up tonight, 
What I want to do first uh, with you, Big D, is we actually have three amplifiers here set up and hopefully it'll go pretty quick. Now, as I tell people in every show when we do this, this is live. This isn't doing a dyno that's been pre-recorded and we can edit stuff out. We're doing this live on the fly. So we may have to move, a jumper lead may jump off, something may happen, we have to reset. Uh, an amplifier might go up in smoke, you never know. When you're running them through dynos, especially like I, apparently how I do dynos, I think I run them a little harder than most. <laughs> So be prepared for those type of things. But what I want to do is kind of go through the steps here. And of course, Derek, I want any input you got into this. And what we've got set up here, and I know Tim will get some close-up shots of this when we get to it. We actually have a CXA 800.1 amplifier, which is our 800 watt monoblock amp. Then we have a key 500.1 amplifier, which is out of our key line, which is the smart amp, so it can adjust itself, uh, re-EQ for the factory EQ or the factories, the things the factory does to roll the bass off that if you're putting in a subwoofer, you want all that stuff back. The key amplifier actually brings all that back for you automatically through a DSP routine. And then we got a key 200.4 amplifier. And these are the three amps I want to go through and test. And what we've got set up here, and like you said, if you're using the big SMD Tony Diamori box, you don't have to provide any external load resistors because basically, you still, as you see in your videos, you select what impedance you want and there's a bunch of relays in there that select that impedance and then you're testing that amplifier into that fixed impedance in that box. Whereas with the handheld, which is what we're using tonight, we've got the speaker wires run through the handheld. We're using a big fixed resistor loads that we have. But the cool part about this is it's really compact and easy to move into the studio and show those things. So the one thing we can't do tonight that you normally do on your videos is we can't do a dynamic power test because that's not a function of the handheld meter. And my understanding of how this meter works is when it's in the test mode, am I correct that basically what it's doing is a... Uh, uncertified run when it comes the clipping light comes on would that be that's correct? correct yes it's going up to clipping and kip i will say based on the firmware that is in your amm1 uh, it should be able to do the dynamic test because uh, the newer versions of the firmware will allow the pulse tones you can actually play back music as well uh, and it'll measure the the highest uh, RMS peak value of your music as well. So oh. it just depends on the firmware level. If you have an older version that has an older firmware, you can contact DeMore Engineering and they'll update your firmware. And uh, you can get some of the new features that are available. So that is an option as well. Well, I think after the show, we'll do some firmware checking and see what we got. And if we need an update, we'll do that and we'll figure out. So basically to do that, then what you're saying is you do have to use the pulse tones off the test CD, but then you can do the same dynamic burst testing on this meter as yes. you do the big box. Yes. I've, okay. I've shared the uh, 81 disc with some people who have just this and they do that on their YouTube channel. Some of the other guys that test amplifiers use specifically this. Uh, utility this tool and they can test amps kind of the same way like you said certified and then dynamic they can't do you actually can i said certified the uncertified test of the clipping now you could do the certified test if you put another tool in line the dd1 measures up to one percent thd and actually way back when i first started testing amplifiers i bought the dd1 and i used it with an oscilloscope that way I could tell as soon as it hit 1% THD, the light came on on the DD1, and so I knew what the power was. And if you've, Kip, if you've ever seen those little portable handheld scopes, you know how horrible the resolution is, and it's hard to tell when it hits clipping. So it was very useful to, to use a tool like a DD1 that can capture that 1% THD, whereas when you're using these little scopes you get off Amazon for 100 bucks, I can tell you right now, when you see that wave square off, it is well beyond clipping and well beyond the distortion factor. You know, you're right on that. And, and we've got, you know, ironically, we've, we have the AMM1 set up here to do the testing. Next to the AMM1, we actually have a portable O-scope. And the portable O-scope is a little bit better resolution than those $100 ones you find off of Amazon. This is more like the $600 version. So it's, a, it's better resolution. So we're gonna be able to see actual clipping happening on that meter. Then along with that, we have a Fluke 
uh, meter that has a clamp amp meter on it so we can actually see what kind of current pull that each of these amplifiers is going to pull here in the testing in the studio. Um, now to kind of give you a background, then we also have a, a tone generator. It's, it's a lab grade, just a box. It gives us the ability to select any frequency we want and adjust the output from anywhere from no volts all the way up to 20 volts output. So we've got a ton of voltage we can drive out of that box in the amplifiers. So we've got this set up here. And then uh, for power, we're just using a, a, an 80 amp power supply, but then we're also backing it up with a huge 80 amp hour lithium battery. So we got plenty of battery and plenty of voltage to do it here. We can probably test a 1500 watt amp here on the bench, no problem with what we got going on here. Anything bigger than that, I'd probably wanna go across the street here to the lab like we've done the bigger tests and get into the big boy power supplies and things like that. But for what we're doing here for these power ratings, what we've got set up here is fine. And for those who are interested, if we get to that point, we actually not only have a, a infrared thermometer so that we can measure temperatures, but Ernie, Ernie's the techie guy. And Ernie wouldn't let it go. And of course, you did this to me last time and said it. So of course, we did it. We went to engineering and we brought out the FLIR. <laughs> Gotta have so. the FLIR. Gotta now, see I'm the full <laughs> predator effect of the amplifier. <laughs> what does it now, look like, right? <laughs> Now, the cool part is we don't have the backs of our amplifiers here, so we're not going to be able to do that same type of thing that you do where you actually show the internal parts individually. Maybe we'll do that in a future show when we do some other amplifiers, so we're just going to be able to look at the thermal footprint of the amplifier. So we got a lot of tools set up here so we can look at amplifiers and talk about what the AMM1 and what amp dynos and, and what basically an oscilloscope, what all these tools allow you to measure on an amplifier. And then once we go through these tests, I wanna circle back and I actually have some graphs I wanna talk about and show. We wanna show the other things that, you know, if you're trying to set up and just try to get things maximized in your car audio system, make sure you're not clipping, you're doing those things, these tools are great for that. But when it comes to engineering an amplifier, we have a whole host of other tools that we have to use because there's other things that are important to us than just how many volts does this amplifier swing out its outputs. You know, there's a whole host of that. And I'd like to, to get work that into the show and actually go through that list and show people the other areas that we test an amplifier for or design an amplifier as far as targets so that it does what it does. Yeah, Kip, I think it, it goes without saying, you know, way back when I started testing amps, it's been almost 10 years ago, the main reason I did it was curiosity for the main thing, right? To find out, do these amps really put out the power they say they do? So companies like Kicker and some of the other big brands that publish the true power output, they shine when we do these tests, right? But there's these other companies that, you know, when we test, we, you don't ever know, right? What, you gonna, what are you getting for your money? And so I think, you know, things like this are really helpful for companies that publish true power, such as Kicker. And it's just the other ones that, that it helps out. Because like I said before, and I'll, I'll say it again, if you can at least meet, meet your power spec, then all these other things we're going to talk about after that, I, I don't trust you if you don't at least meet your power spec. So that's the thing where I see a company like Kicker, they're obviously doing their power. They do their rated power plus a little more. We know that. And then you guys do a whole lot more analyzation on your amplifiers. But if, if I'm XYZ company and I, my amp is half the price of Kicker's, but yet it, I say it's the same power and it's nowhere near it because we can now test that and these people are being held responsible now. You know, it's funny you say that, and when it comes to the amplifier design for us, it's more than just power. There's a whole lot of other things that we look at on amplifier design, and that's why we want to, after we show how we measure these powers and use these tools that are fantastic tools for everyone to have and use, is what is a manufacturer or a company that's actually designing its products, what other lengths or steps do we go through to make sure that this amplifier doesn't just make voltage, but is it quiet? Does it actually produce 20 to 20 as far as frequency response? Do the crossovers actually work where we say they're going to work? All that stuff stuff is in there and we actually measure those things and it'll be cool to look at those when we come back around on that. So with that said, I'm going to mosey around the corner here because I got to kind of get in front of the camera so Tim will be busy here working between cameras and I'm going to fire up all this gear so that we can get into our first amp dyno test which is going to be the CXA 800.1. That's going to be our first test. Okay. Well, while you're firing it up, I'll, I'll go through something really quick that a lot of people may not know about the big amp dyno. I have a lot of people ask me what kind, you know, how big of an amplifier it can test. Well, the amplifier dyno, the big one, the 81, can test up to 24,000 watts at half an ohm. However, you have to be able to provide the electrical. 
right? These things do not have any kind of electrical systems built in. It just has resistors on the big AD1. The one that Kip is showing tonight is just one that you can put in your pocket, have a 9-volt battery, have a few extra 9 volts because it likes to eat them. But um, you can take this wherever you want. You can measure your friend's power. I know some people used to buy these, and they would, when they'd go to shows, and they'd use it and, and charge people to <laughs> tell them how much power their aunt was putting out. So things like that can be useful. But again, for the big dyno, a lot of people think that, hey, I've got plenty of electrical to test whatever. That's not the case. You still have to provide the electrical through power supplies, batteries, whatever, to be able to get your power in to be able to measure the power coming out. Absolutely. You know, and that's probably, that's a huge lesson that a lot of people don't understand when it comes to, hey, I want to buy this big amp and I want to run all these big subs. And, you know, they may even go to the extra step and go, okay, I ran two strands of one op back and I, and I upgraded my grounds and I put an extra battery or two in the back. And they do all that. But what they fail to recognize or realize is when you do a big system like that, or even a small system, at the end of the day, the alternator is what produces the electricity in your car. And so if you're going to put in a system that is going to be a 10,000 watt system or a 15,000 watt system or a 20,000 watt system in a vehicle, you got to start at the very front of this food chain because if you can't feed it, the amount of energy and wattage and voltage at once, that amplifier, it may say 10,000 watts on the front and it may actually bench 10,000 watts when it has enough current and voltage to feed it, but in your car, it may never achieve that at all. So it, there's a lot more money involved in doing big systems like that than just buying the big amp and buying the big speakers. You have to upgrade everything in that vehicle or you're never gonna get the performance out of it, ever. That is 100% true, uh, Kip, and I think a lot of people skip on that fact. You know, the ones that run the four gauge uh, CCA and buy the 10,000 watt amp. <laughs> you know, we, 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 maybe we need to do that. some more training on that. <laughs> You know, I actually love doing those shows, uh, and there's a lot of great conversations that have spun out of that between you and I and then Kicker, and we may have to do some more shows like that to show people the true limitations of those wire. Man, I, I tell you, if you're interested in that and you haven't seen it, you got to go back into our YouTube feed and find it, and it's the Science of Wire shows. We did a part one and a part two, and what's interesting about that is we probably need to relabel them how to burn an amplifier up, because that's what it ended up being, <laughs> was a show about how long we can run an amp under a dyno. Yeah, that that still impressed me how long that that KXA 2400.1 ran. It was several minutes at full bar full full blast, which is not typically have, done. We still have that amplifier and another one sitting right here in the table in the studio for future testing of stuff we can do, so it's still kicking. I mean, that's what's cool about it. So, this what I want to show real quick before I move the meter probes is this uh, is the O-scope I'm pointing to right here in the orange box. This is actually the oscilloscope that we'll be working on. This is the SMD AMM1 meter. This is our fluke, which goes down to a clamp amp probe, so we're actually measuring the amount of current that's coming up into all of our amplifiers. What I wanted to show first is we're actually using a, a load resistor, a big, heavy load resistor in the back, and I wanted to show you here that we're right at about, it's, it's a one ohm resistor, but you can see on the meter here, it's reading 0 0.8, 0 0.9, it's fluctuating back and forth a little bit, but we're going into a one ohm load, and I wanted people to see this so they'd know what impedance we're actually running these two base amplifiers into, and so we are using a one ohm load. Right, and so the other thing real quick, Kip, to uh, explain the difference of the resistive versus reactive loads, right? So your speaker could have a one ohm uh, reactive load, whereas these resistors are going to stay one ohm the entire test, whatever frequency Kip puts in, it's not going to change that load on the amplifier. With the Correct. reactive load, such as a speaker, the, the load is going to vary both, based on a lot of different factors, whether it's your box size, the air temperature, uh, the frequency that's going in. There's a whole lot of factors that are going to affect what we some people call box rise uh, or ohm rise, whatever you want to call it. But your one ohm with a speaker being reactive is going to fluctuate a whole lot more than the resistor. But the good thing about what Kip is showing here is we have consistency. We have a way to test an amp at one ohm. We have a way to test another amp at one ohm. That way you can test it consistent across the board. 
it's, it's kind of a bar, it's a consistent bar so that you know every amplifier is being measured by the same standard. And like, and like you said, Derek, that's the thing is, you know, a lot of people, and that's what's cool about the blue handheld meter, is you can actually put this in your car. You might test an amplifier on an amp dyno into a fixed load and it could be 2,000 watts. And then you put it in your car and based upon the impedance rise of the system, whether you want to call it box rise or just the natural way a woofer works, either way, you can see that impedance is rising up to the point where you're not getting that 2,000 watts out of the amplifier because it's not at that resistive load that it was tested at. So those are the things you're going to run into on that. The other thing I want to show here, now that I've moved, I showed the impedance on there so people know what we're using here, is here on the front meter. Ernie, if you could go to cam three. Yeah, I was holding the camera. Oh, sorry. I also want to show you that this is the voltage that we've got currently in our battery setup here. So you know how much voltage we're dealing with. We have 14.44 volts of uh, 12 volt DC here to work with. And so with that said, what I want to do now is I'm going to put this back into DMM mode. And what we're going to do, I'm going to turn the amplifiers on and then I'm going to step back out of the way enough here. So, oh good, Ernie can view of it here. And basically what this knob here lets me do is bring up the output volume of this tone generator. And we are using a 50 hertz signal to go into the equipment here. So what we'll be looking at here is how much current are we pulling for that amplifier to make that power? What does the SMD meter tell us it's doing? And we're, gonna, we're in the test mode where it actually goes up to clipping and measures it right there. So this will be the uncertified test then, I guess would be the correct terminology to call that. And then you can actually see it on the oscilloscope right here beside it. You can see the sine wave at the same time. So we have all these three tools set up at the same time. And so now I'm gonna be the monkey that throws the switch and we're gonna make it happen. So I'm gonna flip, I got a switch here. I'm gonna flip, that'll turn our amplifiers on. See our amplifiers come on and stabilize. Everything looks good. And let's see what we have happen here as I turn the volume up. And as you can see on the meter there, you can see the sine waves getting bigger and bigger. I'm turning it up. Wow, you've already hit it. I see 1,020 or 1,028. Yep, 1,020. If you can see that on the meter, I'm gonna turn the volume back down. But you can see on the SMD, we ran up to clipping. So this little CXA 800.1 amplifier at clipping did 1,020 watts. And uh, unfortunately, this is the good news, bad news, where you kind of have to trust what I'm telling you um, versus the fact that we don't have the big SMD dyno meter out here, is I know this amplifier under dyno testing will even exceed that. It'll do, I've seen them do 11, 11 to 50, 1180, 12 and some change. I know under dynamic burst, this amplifier will even exceed that 1020 rating on that. And we're really proud of this because besides the other things that we feel make this a great amplifier, which we'll get into later on in the show, is that this is a rated 800 watt amplifier. This is actually the, according to the data that we get as far as following sales trends, I think one of the most popular, if not the most popular amplifier in the United States going on right now. We sell a ton of the CXA 800.1s. It's a reliable amp, it's small, it produces a ton of power, and what's really cool is that you guys get to see it here doing 1,020 watts right here on a test bench. And the meter timed out, so I'm gonna turn it back on. And we can go ahead and throw another test in there. And what was the uh, current? Did we see that, Kip, or did we, did we miss that to see how much we current? We missed we were... that. That's what okay. we'll do it again. And what <laughs> I'll do there, thank you for asking that. What we're going to do this time is I'm actually going to put the meter into min-max mode, and we will just capture the max current. Right now, I've got uh, all three of these amplifiers. When I flip the switch, they all power on. So right now, according to the Fluke amp meter, we're drawing about three amps of current. It says we're drawing to run all this up here. So with that said, here we are all set up again. Let's do another run. Okay, that one there, it, oh, I have, I've got on real-time power. Let me put it back. Let me change the mode. That's my mistake. I thought I had it in the right mode, and I didn't. Okay, let's do it again. Okay, so red clipping light came on. I know it, then it stops reading. It just, it's there at the clip reading or maximum output thing, 1,020 watts. We've got the same power reading. And over here on the fluke meter, 129 amps. Can you see that on the screen? Yep. 129 amps. And, uh, of course, you, you see the, uh, the clipping there on the screen of the uh, oscope. Yes. It's, can you it's, see it's, the oscope? Yeah, it's it's kind of difficult to see, but we can see that it clipped at that point. Um, 
Maybe if you do it one more time, Kip, and don't turn it up quite so fast, we could see the see if the, we get the clipping to line up with the light, or how close it would get. Again, this is a nicer um, O scope. I think it's got a little bit higher resolution than the typical ones that you see on Amazon for around a hundred dollars. So this may be a little bit a um, little bit better showing of that comparison. Okay, so here here we go. We'll try to bring it up a little bit slower. Okay, so if you can look over here on the waveform, you can see the waveform is just starting to get a little a little wonky on the top and bottom. I'll get my finger out of the way. And over here, we're at 959. And now we're into some serious. So on that one there, the, it caught the clipping at 959. And you can see the waveform on the thing. We're, we're really squared off there right now. We're probably somewhere 3 to 5% THD, I would guess, at that point right there. And I'll bring it back down and smooth it out. So right there. And so over. people may wonder what the difference is. You know, you got you got 1020 the first couple of times pretty consistently. Obviously, your your voltage um, may have sagged just a little bit. That will affect the output power some. Um, that could be why it's not right at exactly 1020. And rarely are you going to get exactly the same measurement. You can take the same amp and test it five or six times, and it's going to be within a few watts of each other. But you're never going to get exactly the same. Right, there's going to be some ch some changes on that. So a lot of factors, right? Because you have yes. the amplifier itself uh, heating up. Uh, you, the components inside the amp are, are um, just changing a little bit as it heats up. So you're not going to get exactly the same. But within, I'd say, 2 to 5% difference is acceptable um, when you're doing multiple tests of the same amplifier. I don't know if, if Tim can even get a read on this here, but I'm looking at here with the infrared. And of course, this amplifier was at room temperature when we started. And now I'm getting, oh, there's some spots on the amplifier that are about 120 degrees Fahrenheit. There's a 122. So yes, we are warming the amplifier up. The chassis is definitely getting some heat going on in it. Yeah, and you know, sometimes people uh, are worried, Kip, about the temperature. Obviously, the heat sink is doing its job when it gets hot, right? Because it's pulling the heat away from the components on the inside. Yes. So I would say it's not always the worst thing for your amp to get hot. Um, but I would say that you do want to give it some uh, air circulation if you do notice the amp getting hot so that it, it doesn't have to work overtime and you don't run into the issue where uh, it goes into protect or whatever because of thermal. So make sure you, um, you know, keep it, keep some air circulation around your amp or put a, fan or something around it if, if you notice that it's getting extra hot. You know, the heat sink, and that's a very valid statement, uh, Derek, is the heat sink is designed to get hot because it's pulling heat away from all of the transistors that are mounted to the heat sink inside, whether those are your power supply transistors or your output transistors, but that is what it's doing. It's pulling heat away from those. So getting warm is perfectly normal. You should expect the heat sink to get warm. And of course, the harder you drive it and the longer you drive it, uh, the warmer it's going to get. Uh, we design into all of our amplifiers, and I don't know if we'll be able to get this on camera or not. Hopefully we can, but here's a FLIR reading. Can you see that on the camera? Maybe, maybe not. Drop down a little bit. Arnold Schwarzenegger is hiding right now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Get to the chopper. But uh, there's a FLIR reading, you can see, and it's reading about 130, 132. So the temperature obviously has risen some sitting here because the heat is coming out of the transition device and it's working its way out to the heat sink. But all of our amplifiers, there is thermal protection built into all our amplifiers. And we let these run up into the point, we have a safe thermal zone, and when they reach that point, we shut the amplifier off. And the reason we shut the amplifier off is because you have two choices. Turn the amplifier off and let it cool and then let it turn back on after it's fallen beneath, beneath its uh, maximum threshold or let the solder melt and all the parts fall off. And so I don't think people want all the parts falling off their amplifier. So thermal protection, it's not a fault in an amplifier. It's actually an amplifier saying, you have made a whole lot of voltage with me and it's time for me to take a chill pill. I got to cool down so that everything comes back, comes back down to a realistic temperature and then you can go back and do it again. And we'll get into that in a, in a little bit when we talk about the AP testing. Yeah, the other thing, uh, in addition, Kip, people should remember about these tests is here we're showing sine wave. We're showing a solid sine wave test into the amp. Yes. When you use the amp in your car, 
most people don't listen to sine waves. Now, granted, some of these rebase songs have some pretty long bass tracks. They do. That, that goes back to your electrical, right? If you listen to music that has really long bass notes, you need to have really good electrical. But if you listen to music that's very dynamic, you can actually get by with a lot less electrical than you think you might need because you're not requiring that constant, consistent current that you would need with a system with long notes. And, and that's the key is people have to be realistic about what they're listening to and at what volume level and for how long. Uh, I learned that a long time ago in my young days as a, a guy growing up who's into car audio. And I just knew that if I had my system in my car cranked full tilt boogie as one of my patented trademarks, you know, if I had it turned all the way up, I could cruise for about 15 minutes. And then what I had to do was I turned the system down and I go run around out in the country at 55, 60 mile an hour for about 20 minutes, charge the batteries back up with the alternator and I could come back and I could do another full tilt 15, 20 minute run again. And it's, you know, some people go, oh, I keep it playing, keep it running. What you don't understand is I am doing what the system is capable of. I'm using up all the energy reserve. The alternator can't keep up and now I need to go recharge the battery so we can do it again. And a lot of people just aren't realistic about what their system is capable of. They don't know their voltage. They don't know the limitations. They just expect it to play full tilt all the time. And it takes a lot more to do that if that's what you're into. That's right. We are lucky these days with new battery technology with lithium that's come out now, which uh, gives you a lot more reserve. As people know, because a lot of the cars obviously the EV cars, the Teslas and the others use these lithium cells, which uh, have a huge amount of storage capacity. They do, they have a huge amount. So I wanna switch amplifiers. Before we do, I'm gonna do one more quick run on the CXA 800.1. So I'm just gonna run it up here real fast. And there we go. I'm gonna bring it back down. And you can see here on the meter, we pulled 130 amps of current. I'll get my finger out of the way. There's 130 amps of current, and you can see again, 1,020 watts of power up there and it wouldn't hit the clipping indicator. So the CX800.1, it's the real deal. It will definitely make power and then some. It's a legit amplifier. So I'm gonna shut that down. And while I'm doing that, I'm going to grab a screwdriver and I'm going to move the speaker wire from the CXA 800.1 and I'm going to move it to the key 500.1, which is the next amplifier we're going to test. I must say, Kip, uh, you know, hats off to Kip for doing this live. I've never, like, been able to do this live because, yes. <laughs> one, uh, it, it, you know, it, it shows what goes on behind the scenes. In a lot of cases, I have to be extra careful when I hook things up because I don't want to mess anything up. But uh, <laughs> also, you know, it's difficult to keep it interesting as you're going along. So Kip is good about giving his Kipisms and stuff as we're going along to keep us, uh, <laughs> keep well, us enthralled cool in this event. The cool part is I've got you here, so the dull space is in between while I'm just moving wires. I've got you here for the entertainment. <laughs> That's what helps. Yeah, I, I can try. So I'll go back real quick because we did talk about the, the power uh, that these can measure. Now, I was looking through the AMM1 manual, and, hope, and maybe if Steve is still in the chat, he can help me because I didn't see any maximum power that this will measure. I know that uh, Bill, Bill Frog, posted the picture that I gave him that I measured of 1.21 gigawatts, <laughs> but I'm not sure what the true maximum of this is. I think it's around 25,000 watts that this will measure, that's, but uh, we can get way, clarity. That's a lot of power. It's a lot of power. It's not 1.21 gigawatts, but you know, it's, it's a good amount. So but you know what, what, the other thing that I've seen, Kip, and some people in their systems, what they do is they mount this actually in line in their car. So yes. as they're testing and as they're playing around, they can, they can see the true power and move things around and, you know, change their box tuning and stuff like that and see what, what uh, kind of power they get. Absolutely, there are people who do that because it lets them figure out maybe they need to redesign their box to get the uh, the impedance rise to happen at a different place or the tuning on their port maybe isn't where they need to be. And a guy who he's uh, he's done a lot of videos on it and is pretty popular is and I'm going to probably get his name wrong. But it's Parker, I think it's DeShill if I get the last name correct. And he does that, which is exactly what you're talking about. He uses one of these AMM ones in line and does a lot of uh, woofer demonstration videos. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, that, it's it's very neat to see that in person. I mean, that's what people want to see. What's the true power that's going to the speaker? And that's the best way to do it. 
Okay, so what I've got done is I've moved the speaker wires from the CXA 800.1 we are now connected to the key 500.1, and of course, the tone, the test tone that we're doing, I moved the RCA plugs from the CXA 800.1 back here to the key 500.1, and then we're going to go ahead and we're going to do a dyno run on this key 500.1. But before I walk around and hit that, Tim's giving me a good reminder, it's 825. If you're new to the channel, you're just tuned in, or if you're an old schooler and you forgot, we got five minutes to enter the contest tonight. Remember, tonight's link is kicker.fun forward slash dyno 500. So go hit that link before 8.30 to get entered in the contest tonight because the grand prize winner is actually gonna walk off with a key 500.1 amplifier, which is pretty dang cool. Wow, that is cool. And remember that's D-Y-N-O, not yeah. D-I-N-O. Because I get that yeah. all the time when people ask me about dyno, it's D-Y-N-O. Well, D-I-N-O, that actually turned into oil so you can drive your car. D-Y-N-O is how you label your stuff or find out how much power your amplifier makes. That's right. We're, we're testing power to the wheels tonight, folks. <laughs> Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and the monkey flips the switch. I'm gonna turn my remote turn back, my remote leads back on, so everything's firing up. I'll make sure my amps turn on and they stabilize. Everything looks good. And so now what we're gonna do, let me set the min-max meter back up. So there's the max. Let me turn the amplifier dyno meter back on. And I'll get it into the correct mode. And I know this is, you know, it's one of those things doing this live, there's a lot of things that you may not see, uh, you know, when you watch an amplifier dyno video like Big D puts together that is uh, very, I'll use the word polished. There's a lot of these setups, like you don't see him actually setting up the gain on the AMM1 to make sure everything works properly. There's a lot of things that happen behind the scenes to actually get those amp dyno videos produced. And I gotta give a shout out. Uh, you do a lot of them and uh, Derek, I watch every single one of them. They're all great. Thank you. Yeah, you're right, Kip. That is part of the setup process, and I do not include it in the video just because it's redundant, but you obviously want to ensure that the amp is matched to the head unit. In this case, you're using a signal generator. It's a little different, but still make sure that they're matched. So I'll, I'll let you go ahead and let's see what this key 500.1 will do. Absolutely. So here we go. So the monkey flipped the switch, the amplifier's on, we've got everything set up, and we're going to go ahead and ramp up the, the uh, output voltage from the uh, tone generator, and we'll see what happens. Okay, so I'm going to bring it back down. Wow, 643 is what I see. 643 watts into one ohm, and that little amplifier, it drew 91 amps of current. That was the total current draw, so I'm going to go do a reset on this. And we'll do a reset on this. And we'll do it again. Crank it up. There we go, clipping light came on. On the amplifier dyno, 653 watts. And current pull, 91 amps. That's not and bad from a 500 watt amp, Kip. <laughs> no, and, and here's the thing. You, you know, I, I don't want him to necessarily do it right now, but the, the 500.1, literally, it's the size of my hand. I mean, we're talking about a 500-watt amplifier with an integrated DSP that removes those challenges that are present in a factory system, which is what the key amplifier line is designed for, is you put this into the factory vehicle, it's designed to take up to a 40-volt input signal. So it doesn't matter what's in that factory vehicle, you can take in the speaker leads and tie right into the RCA plugs and go right into this amplifier. There's no, you don't want a line output converter. There's no need for any other path or object to be in the path between the signal and the amplifier. The key is designed to take it. And then it has a setup routine. There are tones you download from kicker.com and you go through some test routines and it electrically measures the signal at that amplifier and then it re-EQs and adjusts that so that if you're looking at your car and a lot of factory cars do is either they're taking all the bass away to begin with, they just don't let you have any real low frequency because they're doing that to protect the speakers in the car. Or as you turn the volume up on your radio, they'll start rolling the bass off so that it's also protecting the speakers in the car. What you have to understand from the factory standpoint, they just want the speakers and the amp and the radio in the car to last three years and 36,000 miles and you don't have any problem. And blown up speakers is a problem. So by removing low frequency, they're removing the problems that they think or they know could be present in blown speakers. And so the key amplifier sees all that electrically it has kind of like its own built-in RTA and looks at all this and goes, okay, I need to re-EQ and do all this so that now all this low-frequency bass that the factory's taken away from you, 
I'm going to give it back to you. Because other than that base roll off and things like that, you know, factory radios aren't the, the trash bins that they used to be back in the 80s and early 90s. Factory radios today are actually pretty decent. They just don't have RCA plugs on them, and you got to deal with the equalization and things that the factory has put into there. If you work around those things, it's a great source unit. It's a touch screen, it's got your steering wheel controls, USB, Bluetooth, aux in. I mean, it's got everything you need. So the key line amplifiers let you integrate and just do what you want, which is add more power, re-EQ the system to get that bass back that the factory took away. And the fact that it does all that in a box that's about the size of my hand, that's pretty impressive. And as you can see on the meter, it exceeds its 500 watt rating easily. It does about 653 watts. Yeah, that, that's really good. I mean, uh, in my test, I like to see rated power plus about 10%, and I'm happy. In this case, we're well above that. And just to show it's not a fluke, I'll do it again. I reset the clamp meter and I reset the uh, SMD meter. We'll do another run up here real quick. There you go, 643. So 640, and again, drew 91 amps of current through the across the clamp meter. That's pretty consistent right across the board, Kip. Yeah. And just, and, just, and just for those out there in the cheap seats, we'll do it one more time. <laughs> So here we go. Clipping light indicator is on on the meter. We'll back everything back down. Again, 642 watts, 91 amps of current draw. So as you can see, the little 500.1 key amplifier, does it make 500 watts? It absolutely makes 500 watts. And if 10% is your standard, so you'd say 550. So I would say at 640, 650, we're definitely above what you consider a, a fair rating standard. Yeah, I mean, it's it's well above that, but we come to expect that from, from companies like Kicker and some of the others that uh, are going to give you that power that you're paying for. So, like you said, there's a lot more to this amp than just the power, but, you know, if you can't actually hit your power, then you have problems, according to me. Uh, so, that we've got that resolved here. We're definitely hitting the power, hitting well above the rated power. And, and you haven't looking, blown anything up yet, Kip. And the other thing I'm going to say real quick is, based on how fast you turn that volume knob, I'm guessing that your wife doesn't let you control the TV volume. <laughs> I, I am also, besides a car audio nut, I am also a home theater audio video nut. And I do have a, a very nice home audio video system. And, and I think that when things blow up, when there's explosions or tanks rumbling or all that stuff's happening, I should feel it. It should hit me in the chest. I should get that visceral experience with my movies at home. So my wife, she, she gives me grace at times and lets me get away with watching certain movies like that. And she even enjoys them to some degree. But what's funny about it is over the years is, is my wife, who really wasn't an audiophile or a video file, as I like to claim I am, um, she's kind of learned a lot of things by going with me and shopping. And now what's really strange is we can go into a store and walk around and my, my wife will be the one to look at me and go, that TV doesn't have a very good contrast level. Doesn't have very good blacks on it, does it? it so she's even, she's learning the lingo. She's learned to what looks good and what doesn't look good. And so she's learned to appreciate it. And even on the audio side, it's just that if we're gonna watch a movie with her, I usually have to grab the controller and turn the bass down about six and a half to seven dB. I like to run my bass at home on my home theater, at least for her, which I call an average listener. I run it about seven dB hot, but that's what I like. You and me both, man. Same way, you gotta feel it. I do. That's the way I am. So hopefully those two tests on the bass amplifier, as you guys thought, was cool. But we've got time, so I'm going to work it in here real quick. I've got another amplifier here, which is the Key 200.4. And I've got a different fixed resistive load already hooked up to it because it doesn't run on a 1-ohm load. It actually runs on a 4-ohm load per channel. So I'm going to lift up off the floor. It's already wired up to the key. This is another fixed resistive load bank. So if, if you guys didn't get a good view of the one that's over here because it's kind of hidden by the meters, this is what it looks like. This is a big silver box. It's an aluminum heat sink. And inside of it, these are lab grade resistors. And, and these are what we use in the labs here day in, day out, uh, maybe even bigger versions of these for amplifier testing. But this is what we have over in the studio. It's got speaker wires connected to it and that's going to the key amplifier. So I'm just gonna set it up here. And then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna move the, the probes for the, uh, the AMM1, I'm gonna move them to this resistor bank and I'm gonna move the oscilloscope probes to this resistor bank so we can now measure this amplifier. So that's what I'm gonna do real quick. So fun well, fact to. here, these resistors are used in a couple of other applications. Anybody wanna guess what they're used for outside of the audio world? 
Do, 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 trains. The brakes for train. trains. Also, really? the brakes for the elevators. They use resistors like that to help dissipate the heat for the brakes. I'll be darned. Well, I didn't know that. I just learned something, too. You can uh, learn more next time from the Big D <laughs> learning session from Big Dummy University. Big D University, we cover all of the bases that interest you. That's right. right so I, Literally. So I, and speaking of bases, <laughs> we expect at the end L7X hooked up for the Do It Bump Dose segment. I've already seen them in the chat. I haven't really seen them say that, but I'm going to ask for them. You want to do it bump section for L7X? Yeah, sure do. Could have fit that I in. Think, Put I you think on the we'll spot. I think we'll have to find a way to make that happen now that you've put me on the spot. Thanks, I appreciate it. No, no worries at all. I'll, I'll hand deliver it in my own vehicle. All right. Okay, so if I've got everything set up here properly, I'm gonna flip the switch, there'll be no smoky smoky. And that's the other thing doing these things live. Sometimes you think you get it hooked up right and you don't. If you're recording these to edit later, you can hide all your mistakes. So I, here we're I've never blown an amp, Kip. I've never, <laughs> never hooked it up wrong. It just doesn't happen. <laughs> we're all perfect. Ever. Yeah, exactly. That's what I like people to think about me. So back to the meter. So I'm going to set the max on that. I'm going to clear. I've got to SMB say, while Kip is doing this real quick, props to the marketing guy for being able to do all this is all i got to say. Props to the marketing guy. You know, I started off as an installer and, you know, an audio enthusiast years ago. I mean, it, very young. I started into anything electronic. And it's uh, my father. I have to blame my father and my grandfather. They always instilled in me that when you take a new job, it doesn't mean you forgot the one you left. And so you take that with you. They had a real strange way of instilling me how to respect and honor other people. Uh, my grandfather, he says, I don't care if you're getting introduced to the president or the janitor. You they deserve a firm handshake and a look in the eye. And so I, that's kind of how I am, even though I you know, do what I do on a daily basis and this being part of it. I'm still a tech guy at heart, too, and it's never going to go away. <laughs> we can still give you props, though. And I'll take them all day long. Okay, so if I got it right here, let's find out. We're going to do a ramp up on this. We've got the same setup, except this is on the key 200.4, and this is a four-channel amplifier. We're looking at just one channel. Uh, the key amplifier is not a bridgeable amplifier. I know a lot of times, Derek, on your channel, you'll take four-channel amps and bridge into two channels to show all channels working. So you'll just yes. have to trust me that all four channels work the same way because we're just looking at one channel. Uh, I could show you the other channel because I have two channels loaded down. I've got the front two channels loaded down. The back two channels are just not doing anything right now. So there's all the stipulations, caveats, terms and conditions in the contract. Let's see what happens. So I'm going to ramp it up. And no, there it just went, there, there it came on. I'm, I'm barely, t there, I'm tickling the clip light. So on the O-scope, we can see that the waveform is clipped off. We're tickling the clip light over here on the SMD meter, and that amplifier is right at 53 watts of power. So the key 200.4, we rate that amplifier at 50 watts by four, and you can see it's doing 53 watts of power. That's right at it, that's what you want. Right at it, and current draw, uh, 13 amps. So now that was just with two channels loaded down, so once you actually put the other two channels online, you'd probably be looking more around, around 20 amps of current draw-ish is what you'd be looking at with all four channels making power. So understand we're only loading down and powering two channels right now. So with that current draw, make understand that's just with two channels at idle and two channels making full power. And we're gonna go in and do another run. There we go. Tickle the clip light. You can see we're clipping over here on the waveform. Get my finger out of the way. Sorry, I keep pointing to that. I feel like I'm helping, but actually my finger gets in the way. 53 watts of power, clipping, and again, 13 amps of current draw out of the system. And he let it run for an extra 30 seconds and no smoke. No smoke. I mean, it's, uh, you know, we've talked about at some point we may hook an amplifier up and just let it run during the whole show and see what happens. <laughs> Since it seems to be what we do here. I mean, that, that goes along a lot with the reliability you know if you're if you're doing things like that then you're putting the amplifier through the stages that most people don't put them through and if it can last then that just tells you they're built tough you know what we'll do here since you bring that up this is what i'm going to do i'm going to run this up for one more dyno test so we're going to just do a, a full run up here uh ernie if you want to go to camera three and get a close-up on this i'm going to just run it up 
know, I did three tests on the other one, so it's not a fluke. So here we go again. There I go, tickled there, clip like just came on, so I tickled it. So again, clipped off waveform. You can see it in the oscilloscope that we're at clipping. Over here on the SMD AMN1, we're at 53 watts of output power. And again, 13 amps of current is what we pulled through the fluke clamp meter uh, for amp amperage draw. So what I'm gonna do here now is I'm actually going to change modes on the meter. This'll, this'll be where I get egg on my face tonight. <laughs> okay, so here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna bring over here. Which mode are you in, Kip? I am in real-time power mode right now, which means it's not gonna do a freeze and hold reading. It's actually showing power, so if I ramp this up and down, it doesn't freeze it, it's showing me power continuously. And so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna run this up to 49, there's 50, 50, 51. It's actually doing real-time power, 48, 49, 50. It's bouncing back and forth. You can see it's clean over here on the oscilloscope and this amplifier is making 50, 51 watts of power. It's 841 on my clock. Let's let it run. That's ah, good, let's let it run. I need, to, I need to warm up my steak dinner here in a little bit. That'll be a great place to do it. So, uh, Ernie, if you can, could you put that in window in window, actually put that scope and the SMD meter and the, the current meter, could you put that up in the bottom window and just let it sit there? We're at 841, we're gonna just let this run for a little bit. And while I'm doing that, what I wanna do, besides look at the grin on Derek's face. <laughs> He's trying to blow it up, people. We're gonna see what happens. We're at 841, we'll, we'll see what we get here. I'm going to actually bring up, and I'll need Ernie to bring this up as an asset on the screen as well, if he can. He can put this in place of the big screen. Let me know when that's up and running. And this is actually a spreadsheet that I got from Joe Hobart. Thanks for that, Ernie. So this is a spreadsheet I got from Joe Hobart. Now we've talked about amplifier testing tonight and of course amp dynos and oscilloscopes. Uh, the, the amplifier dyno that Tony uh, Diamori has created and then Steve Mead, you know, they, got, they promote and use it. It's a fantastic tool. I mean, if you guys are wanting to set the gains quickly and accurately, and know what you're doing. Uh, their distortion detector tools and this AMM1, I don't know that there's an easier to use tool out there. Uh, I still like an O-scope, I'm kind of old school and I like an O-scope, but guys who can use the AMM1 don't understand O-scopes a lot of times. I mean, I've even had to do some training lessons with some of the guys here on how to use an O-scope in the back. Uh, you know, the probes are different, sometimes they're difficult to get on, it's just a different tool, but I grew up on O-scopes. What's cool is that Tony and Steve have taken what an O-scope lets you see and found a quick and easy way to put it into numbers, digits, and lights so that anyone can use it. And I, I think they deserve a shout out for that. 100%, yeah, it goes back and Kip, you know, that, for me, it's the visual thing. Watching the numbers count up is like watching the cars go down the drag strip, right? So sure. seeing the numbers count, people like to see that. Um, so that that's why I enjoy doing it that way. Other than doing both, sometimes I incorporate, just like you did tonight, incorporate the, um, the O-scope as well. But not all the time because I'm fully trusting the tools and what they do and what they're showing Right. And, uh, get them calibrated every couple of years too. So just to have them checked True. out and make sure they're still 100% reliable. So this is actually a sheet I got from Joe Hobart. And Joe Hobart is one of, uh, not just an engineer, but he's the guy who's in charge of the engineers back in R&D on the electric or electronics side of the house here at Kicker. <gasps> and so I just wanted to go through this sheet and kind of show you the things. We use other gear back in the labs, and we're actually gonna probably get one here on the show one night and actually look at it and go through it, but we use what's called APs, uh, audio precisions. And if you got a full decked out AP with all the different filter loads and banks and things that go along with it, you can have about $50,000 in a full AP testing setup. And so what I've got here on the screen that I'm showing you 
This is actually a test sheet of all the different areas and criteria that kick, a kicker amplifier has to be tested and passed. Now the, the thing that's on here, you'll notice we've got, there's gonna be targets and limits or there's ranges. And what a lot of people don't understand about electronics is all the parts that are used to build anything electronic have a tolerance. Uh, you know, it's either plus and minus half a percent, plus and minus one percent, plus and minus three percent, plus and minus five, ten. There's lots of different tolerances. And the tolerance of those parts, it just means if I'm going to specify a one kilo, one K resistor, as this is the part that goes in this slot, I'm going to specify that part. Maybe I'm saying, okay, if I'm within plus or minus five percent, this amplifier will work fine and meet all the specs I'm stating, so I can use a 5% tolerant part. Uh, or maybe I need to use a 10% tolerant part. Uh, the tolerance on parts, the, 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 the smaller you go, so I guess the more, I guess the right way would be say, the more precise the part becomes, so like a 1% tolerant part, you can have a 1K 1% resistor versus a 1K 10% resistor, and the 1% resistor is gonna cost you a lot more money. And it's because it's a, it's a bin part, it's graded, it's built to a higher standard, they're hand tested, they're pulled out, they're batched out. Uh, it, I don't wanna say it's the exact same thing, but it's kinda like when Intel builds all the CPUs, they all come off the same die, but some of them just happen to work faster than others because some of the transistors are, more, some of them may or may not be good or bad, uh, and that just happens. And so you're always looking at when you build anything electronic, where do I meet the specifications I wanna meet all the time with every amplifier versus I'm just putting money in the amplifier I'm never gonna see again. And so that's where you kinda come in to see where there's these ranges. So when we say an amplifier, it's not just a hard number in the sand, there's actually a range because you have to account for, well if an amplifier mysteriously goes down the assembly line one day and it gets all plus 5% tolerant parts, well, that's a great thing. It's going to be above its build. But if you get another amplifier that runs down the assembly line, it happens to magically you get all minus 5% parts. You also need to make sure that amplifier meets your specifications. Does that make sense? <laughs> yeah, 100%. So this sheet here, you can see this is a whole list of things that we go through. You can see there's standby current, idle current. And this is actually, this isn't this 800.1 that we're testing, but this is a CXA. 800.1 amplifier that was run through the testing. And you can see we test the uh, THD at half power. Uh, half power is really, for most listening experiences, a typical power level that most people are dealing with. Uh, the, the volume level that people use and everything. Half power and third power are two numbers you see spoken about a lot, even in pro sound, is you might look at this amplifier that's 3,000 watts, but they'll talk a lot about one third and one half power because with music, that's the area where typically that amplifier is operating. And so you see here, we tested at half power at four ohms. Uh, our, our target is it has to be less than 0.15% THD. You can see this particular amplifier came in at 0.046, so it's well below the THD standard that we've got. We test the low level sensitivity input. We test the high level sensitivity input. Uh, Tim just told me the AMM one timed out, so I'll have to put that thing back on, but you can see the amp still running and you can see the O-scope still running, so hopefully that's good. And by the way, we're at 847, so that thing's been sitting there cooking for six minutes, and it's still going. And we're gonna go on down here a little bit. You can see we look at signal to noise ratio at minimum gain, uh, and reference that to 300 watts and look at it well. It, the spec is it's gotta be at least uh, 95 dB. You can see there it's 113.3. And then uh, one watt, which is a CEA rating, it's gotta meet at least negative 75 dB. We meet ne minus 87.4 on this particular amplifier. Uh, fit, this is the uh, CMR sweep. Uh, this has to do with the common mode noise rejection, which has a lot to do with the balanced input circuitry. Uh, it's a reference number, negative uh, 46.2. They, they know what that means back in R&D. I'm gonna tell you, I don't know what that reference is as far as good or bad. I just know they have a point where that has to reference a negative 46.2, I know is good, because I think I hear them talk all the time, like 30 or up. So uh, there's a number there. You can see, as far as power testing, we test this amplifier at four ohm at 1% at 11.5 volts. We test it at two ohm and one ohm as well. We test it at four ohm, two ohm at 14.4 volt. Uh, it has to meet or exceed all these specs. You can see here, it's, it's gotta be greater than 300 watts. It actually did 364.9. At two ohm, it's gotta be greater than 600 watts. It did 636.3. Uh, current draw at two ohm mono, 1%, uh, 54.3 amps, which is very respectable. Uh, efficiency, I actually, I went past it there, hold on a second. Uh, efficiency at two ohms, mono 1%, it has to be greater than 75%. So, uh, you know, that's pretty uh, interesting that it's gotta be greater than 75%. That's our low point. 
uh, which I know you test amplifiers all the time and look at efficiency numbers and, and things like that. This amplifier actually passed at 81.4%. Uh, one ohm power, it's gotta be greater than 800 watts. This particular amplifier uh, passed at 881 watts and that was at 1% THD at 14.4 volts DC. Uh, short circuit protection, over voltage protection, all these different things, you know, it's either a go, no go, pass, no pass, or it's a range. So over voltage protection, it's gotta be in the 15.5 to 16.5 range. You can see that this amplifier here, 16.2 uh, on, the, on the one, 15.6. Um, so these are all other tests that we put the amplifier through, and then when you look at it in a graph form, give you an idea, so like here is, this is actually the THD plus noise power graph at two ohms mono, and you can see the amplifier starts off way down here where it's making less than one watt of power, you know, way down here, like five, half a watt of power, and the distortion is at 0.1%, it climbs up a little bit, then it drops down drastically and you get to one watt, the distortion keeps dropping down, you get up here into the 10 to 20 watt range, you can see distortion is down there in that 0.01% range, and then you start increasing power, of course THD starts rising, and you get to up here, which is around 407 watts, that's where the knee and the curve is, and that's where it starts taking off and distortion starts rising, which is what an amplifier does, once it reaches its limits, if there's no more power supply, there's no more headroom in the output devices, your distortion starts climbing and going through the roof. And so you can see here as it's climbing up and going through the roof, the target right there is one point, that's 1.28, so that's right at 1%, and it was at 407 watts in this particular test. And so these are graphs that, you know, our guys, they, they create these graphs, they save these graphs, they put them in these Excel spreadsheets so that we have kind of a roadmap to when we're designing this amplifier, what's, what's it supposed to do, what's its targets, how well is it doing? You know, here's the CMR response, so this is the common mode noise rejection. You can see here how well it rejects noise coming in over the balanced inputs all the way across from 20 to 20 kilohertz. You can see it does extremely well at rejecting noise coming into the amplifier. So these are all things that we look at in the amplifier design and they go even into the crossover bench where, you know, we say, like here's low pass crossover, we, we say it's 50, that's what it's marked, that's what we market the product as, it's got a 50 hertz low pass crossover point. And the range has gotta be 45 to 55. So we say it's 50, but it has a tolerance. So it can be between 45 and 55. If it's below that or above that, then it's a no-go. And this amplifier, you can see it was at 51.4, so well within tolerance. Check the slope, 12 dB, it's 11.7, so that certainly passes. Uh, low pass crossover, 200 hertz. It's gotta be between 180 to 200 to 220. This one came in at 194.7, so that's pretty darn close. Uh, low pass slope, it's gotta be 12 dB on this picker, it's 12.1. So as you can see, these are the other things that we test. We test the bass boost, the center frequency, the crossovers, and then again, if you go into the graph side of the, the house, you can see this is actually the response graph showing how the curves work. And so these are other things that we look at when it comes to amplifier design. Besides just how many watts does the amplifier make, we wanna know, does it pass all these other things? And then you get into here, uh, amplifier delay, turn on, muting circuit times, because the last thing we want is the amplifier to be on before all the other electronics in the car, the radio, EQs, DSPs, make sure they stabilize before the amp kicks over. You don't want to hear turn on or turn off pop. We check for all that. Uh, the muting circuit, we check for that. We check for the DC offset, how much it takes to turn the amplifier on. That's necessary if you're interfacing into a factory system. Turn on delay, turn off delay, how much voltage. You can see we test and design for a whole range of things in an amplifier besides just how many watts does this amplifier make. And it's important to see this to understand that there's more to amplifier design than just looking at how much power the amplifier actually produces. We want the amplifier to make every bit of power we tell you it does, but we also want it to do it cleanly. We want it to work in a noisy car environment and reject noise. We want it to have a good signal to noise ratio. We want it to have all those things that come along for the ride that determine what makes a good amplifier. And you know, just voltage is not what makes a good amplifier if you're concerned about how good it's gonna sound, how well it's gonna work, and how well it's gonna be at rejecting noise in your car's environment, which the chassis of a car is just a horribly, horrible environment when it comes to noise. And of course, here's some thermal graphs. You can see they've actually put some in here. This is from the FLIR that they took some measurements they were doing these on. And so I just thought it'd be interesting to show you this, and I'm gonna go back to the StreamYard feeder and you can bring me back on. I thought it'd be interesting to show you this because it shows you the different areas that we test amplifiers or, and or design and target amplifiers to other than just how many watts it makes. Yeah, I think 
a good way to kind of put it into a layman's perspective is what you guys do if you watch Engine Masters and shows like that, you know, you're getting down to the nitty gritty of um, seeing all the different specifications, whereas some people just want to see what the quarter mile is or, or you know, how fast it can go zero to 60 type thing. So the consistency that you're showing here shows that, you know, this is one of the reasons why when people compare a 800 watt amp from Kicker versus an 800 watt amp from Brand X that's sold on Amazon, it's hard to compare the two because the Brand X that's on Amazon or whatever is most likely not been put through all these tests. It doesn't have to meet all the standards that Kicker puts their products to. So, yeah, it's it's one of those things that this and also what Kip's doing right now, trying to fry this amplifier, is showing you, you know, why you're paying a little bit more for Kicker product because you're paying for everything that's going behind it. Okay, so the, I mean, I wish I don't think there's any way I can get this on camera, which is horrible, but I can tell you, it's uh, I'm at 151 degrees on the chassis of the Key 200.4, and when we started this run, we started it at 841. We are now at 855. So, by my calculations, that's 14 minutes. So, so Big D, 14 minutes at yeah. full rated output power. Yeah, no. Uh, most would blow up at this point, or at least shut off thermal protect. The, uh, I'm looking at it through the FLIR. Maybe I can come around the table and get you a view, but I'm looking on the FLIR, and it's found the hot spot on there. It's 157 degrees uh, in about this area of the amplifier, so that's probably where the power supply is. The output devices are probably in that area. Oh, look at Tim. Man, he's my hero. So here's the FLIR close-up of Vernie will go over to it. Yeah. So you can see on that amplifier, we're at 156 degrees on the FLIR. And, and no pun intended, it's still cooking. <laughs> Time to get out the egg. <laughs> but there you go, that's off the FLIR. 157, 156, 157 degrees is what we're seeing on that coming off of the FLIR looking at the thermal graph. And I'm going to let it run. I'm going to let it run to the end of the show. So we started that at 841. We're now at 856. So we're a solid 15 minutes in. And the funny thing about this is, and I keep coming back to it, and I, and I got to lay the blame for this squarely at your feet, Derek, because it's your fault, is when we did the original testing, it wasn't about the amps. It was about the wire capability. But the thing is, to show the wire capability, we had to take an amplifier and really stress test it out in order to draw all the current to show what's going on with the wire. But knowing how we test the Nick amplifiers here, I wasn't worried about doing it. It just was no big deal to me. Yeah, it may squeal, it may do this, but I'm not, I'm not too worried about it. And if it does blow up, I know the guys in the back, I know I can bribe someone to fix me an amplifier. But I wasn't too worried about it. And this is another example of that is that we make products that not only make the power we say they're gonna make, we also do it to a standard that's clean, it's clear, it rejects noise, it's got great signal noise ratio, it's a fantastic product, but it's also designed to do it in the real world environment of a car with a customer who just wants to listen to and enjoy his music for one hour or two hours or three hours or whatever he's doing out on the highway. That's what this gear is designed for. And you know, would I recommend this test for a lot of amplifiers? No, I wouldn't recommend doing what I'm doing right now, but as you can see, I hope you can folks, is this is a key 200.4, we're now coming up on 17 minutes of running at full sine wave output power and there is no test more abusive on an amplifier than full sine wave power at low frequency uh, and we're doing it right here for you so hopefully you, you think it's pretty cool <laughs> I do think it's cool and it's uh, definitely something that would not a lot of the other amplifiers brands would not be able to do this and I you know I even thought about Kip incorporating this in I just need to have somebody that's closer to me that can repair stuff because I'm sure there's going to be a lot of damaged amplifiers. Well, if it's a kicker amplifier that gets damaged, I know someone can help you out. Yeah, I'm not I'm not too worried about the kicker. It's the, you know, some of the others that I've that I tested and will continue to test moving forward. But yeah, this is impressive. Again, you know, when when you're comparing apples to apples, you have to take into consideration things like this. If this amp is able to run for 15 minutes solid at 50 hertz, then you know you're going to get years of reliability out of your car using this amp in your car because it's dealing with the temperature extremes, 
It's dealing with uh, the vibration. It's it's ju- they just build them super super tough. So it's uh, it's a stress test unlike any other that I've seen for an amplifier. You know, and a question, and I'm going to bring this up because I'm looking at the feed here as we're going through this. You know, uh, Kyle Sloan says put it in a hundred degree trunk, then test it. We actually do, Kyle. Uh, we have a stress test environment we do in the back, which is actually alternators from a car uh, with battery power supply, and we test it in warehouse, and then we do throw these in cars. And it's not unusual for kicker employees, for maybe a couple dozen of us during the prototype testing of a product, we'll get emails out and it's like, okay, we need you to throw this in your car and run it for two weeks. Just beat on it like you would if it was anything else. We do those kinds of testing to the product. Now what's gonna happen is, in a room like this, where the ambient temperature is you know, about 74 degrees, it's, it's going to run longer in here before it reaches thermal, but eventually this amplifier will reach thermal. That chassis is gonna to get to the point where it's too hot and then it's gonna go into thermal protection. If you're in a 100 degree trunk, it's also gonna happen. It'll just happen probably a little sooner than it would in an ambient air temperature of this is like, like 72 to 74 degrees. But we design for that, we take that into consideration, uh, and we make amplifiers run as long as we can, but we're also realist about it, and if you're in an environment where the temperature is way too hot, that's why I said in the beginning, we have a protection circuit that intentionally turns them off because at that point, it's either let the solder flow and the parts fall off, or protect the amplifier. We choose to protect the amplifier, but you gotta go a long time to do that. Uh, we actually do a 24 hour thermal abuse test on every single design that we do here in the back in the warehouse. And the amplifier has to cycle on, it has to run at least an hour before it reaches that first cutoff time. And when they're being tested, it's full output sine wave, which is not music. These, these, this is an extreme test. And then once it hits that time, it has to be able to cool, it has to turn itself back on, and it has to sit there and cook and cycle for 24 hours and pass all of its tests and live before it is an approved design. We test them pretty hard. Yeah, I would say so, because if you think about it, you know, when you're using your vehicle, you're gonna be playing music, so that's well beyond the standard uh, use case scenario for an amplifier. Yeah, we're, I'm just testing here with the, the handheld meter. It's looking, we're up to about 160 degrees on the amplifier, roughly. I'm gonna just go around and take a look so I can see from the front. It's still making 50 watts of power. It's still a clean side wave, and we're still drawing no more. Well, there's, there just went to 12, so we're drawing between 11 and 12 amps of current, and it's making all that power and doing it. And the whole key to that is we want someone to be able to put this in their car, get all the benefits of key technology, and, and enjoy it for hours in their automobile. And that's why we do this. And so now we're at 9.01. Um, we are at 22 minutes. We, are, we have now run this amplifier at full 50 hertz sine wave output for 22 minutes or 20 minutes. No, 20 minutes, 22 minutes. Let me do the math on this, 41, 42, yeah, 22 minutes. We're coming up to 23 minutes on this. Can you believe, I, I mean, I'm a little shocked that I'm even letting myself get away with this. I mean, it's warm, it's hot, 160 degrees, it's hot. Ernie's back there laughing at me right now. Yep, it's hot. But yeah, there it is. So, Derek, you got anything to add? Do you have any questions about it? That's awesome. I, I mean, I felt like we kind of covered, you know, most of the different parts here of the test and kind of, um, you know, what's involved with the testing of the amplifiers and things that you need to take into account when you're uh, looking at these results, watching these videos or whatever. You have to understand that um, I'm not doing these real enhanced tests that Kicker does. We don't show that type, um, those t- type tests off yet, but it is it is important to understand that <laughs> that Kicker does it. So if you buy a Kicker product, you buy a Kicker amplifier, you'll know that they've been put through the ringer and that they are going to be reliable. Well, it's... Here, I gotta show this one, 25 hertz to life. The boss is gonna call Kip and has to stop the amp test or get fired. <laughs> it's possible. <laughs> That's funny. So, with that said, you know, if you wouldn't mind, hamburgers are good to eat. Hey, El Fuego, it's a grill. I could definitely warm my leftover steak up from dinner right now. That I can guarantee you. So, with that said, I want to at least draw the winners because we're at 9.03. We've gone about three minutes long here. Let's do the giveaway and get that out of the way. Uh, if you don't mind, would you hang around with us, Derek, while we do the sure. giveaway? Sure. I will be right. here. Mr. Bill Brown, have we got three winners? Yep. Who's winner number three on tonight's show of Kicker Unmasked Live Weekly? 
Winner number three is Noah H. from Florida. Noah H. from Florida, congratulations, sir. You have just walked away with a Kicker Unmasked Live Event t-shirt, a pair of koozies to keep your favorite beverage below 160 degrees Fahrenheit, and a set of EB300 Bluetooth wireless earbuds. We hope you enjoy those. I'll tell everyone, winners right now, and I'll do it when we get to number one. What we need you to do is one of two things. Bill's gonna reach out to you tomorrow via email, or you can reach out to Bill right now by hitting him up at social at kicker.com. Either way, what we need from you is your mailing address, and it cannot be a P.O. box. We have to have a legit address. We also need your phone number. We say this every week, and we're sincere about it. We need your phone number because we have to put it in with the shipper information. That way, on their end, if they can't find you or they need to arrange for pickup or however it needs to work, they've got to be able to contact you. We do not share that phone number with anyone. We do not use it for any marketing purposes. It is strictly to fill in the box on the shipping information label. And we also want you to confirm your shirt size because we want to make sure in the drop-down box you didn't you hit a schmedium when you meant an extra large or whatever like that. So make sure you confirm all that. You can reach out directly to Bill at social at kicker.com or he will be reaching out to you tomorrow via email. Look for it. Uh, respond to that email. You have seven days to claim your prize. Let's get that in your hands. Winner number two tonight, Bill. Winner number two tonight is Zach B. from Missouri. Zach from Missouri, you are winner number two tonight. You're getting the exact same prize package. That's going to be one of the Kicker Unmasked Event t-shirts, like you can see over my shoulder. You're going to get a pair of those koozies and a set of EB300 wireless earbuds. Zach, thank you for tuning in tonight. Hope you enjoyed the show. Look forward to seeing you next Tuesday on Kicker Unmasked Live Weekly. And last but certainly not least, the gentleman who's going to walk away with the big kahuna a key 500.2 amplifier. Bill, who's that lucky winner tonight? Tonight's grand prize winner is Stephen S. from North Carolina. Stephen from Big NC. I know somebody from win NC. <laughs> <laughs> Go, Stephen. That's, that, that's not you playing I'm double dipping, is it there, No, <laughs> that's not me. Go, Stephen S. Stephen S. from North Carolina, you are our winner tonight for the grand prize. You're going to get the key 500.1. Sandy Rue has already got that up at her desk ready to ship out. It is not the amplifier we abuse tested tonight. You're going to get a brand new one in the box. Uh, you're going to get that. We're going to get you a couple koozies to go along with that. And, of course, the Kicker Unmasked Live T-shirt. Again, all our winners, you can reach out to Bill right now at social at kicker.com, or he will be emailing you tomorrow. Either way, we need address, no P.O. box, give us your phone number, and last but not least, confirm your shirt size so we get the right shirt into your hands. So, everyone, thank you for tuning in tonight. Thank you to our winners. Derek, what do you got to say before we roll out of this? I got to say thanks for having me on tonight, guys. It's been a blast. Uh, Kip, you did a great job not blowing up any equipment. And uh, yeah. everybody in the chat here was great to hang out with. Thank you guys for having me on as always. It's always a fun time. And thanks for making great products so we don't have to worry about it, right? You guys just make great stuff, so it's easy to recommend Kicker. You know, we really try to earn people's uh, respect. Uh, and respect is definitely something's earned. Uh, I'm proud to work for the company. I think we make some fantastic products. I see what happens on a daily basis for research, de design, development. I see, you know, people who are here and are passionate about trying to get that product into here so we can get it out in people's hands. And if you got a problem, it happens, whether it's intentional or whether it's something that, you know, had a defect or a flaw. We have people here to take care of that. I'm, I'm proud of what we do here as a company. So uh, thank you for joining us tonight, Derek. We couldn't do a dino show without having you on board. And I think we're going to try to do some more of these in the future. I think people get a kick out of these. I kind of like doing them live because it gets the you get to see what's going on behind the scenes. And if there's a mistake, we're going to show it to you anyway. Hey, great job there, kicker guys, handling and girls, handling everything for tonight. You guys are fantastic. Everything that you guys are seeing is not easy what they're doing here. They make it look easy. It's not easy. <laughs> So you guys rock. Thanks again for having me on. Thanks, Derek. Thank you very much. And I think what I want to roll out with tonight is uh, I'm letting this amplifier roll. We're coming up on 908. We're coming up on 30 minutes of full output at a 50 hertz sine wave. I think we're going to make the 30 minute mark pretty close. Maybe Ernie will bring that up big screen and show that before we actually roll off the end of the night. But Derek, thank you for joining us tonight. It's a pleasure as always. And I look forward to having you on the show again anytime. We love having you. Sounds good. Big D, I'm out of here. He's out of here. Folks, thank you for tuning in to Kicker Unmasked Live Weekly. We have a wonderful time putting on this show. There's five knuckleheads that get to do this every Tuesday night, and believe it or not, we actually love each other and enjoy doing it. That's Tim behind the cameras. It's Ernie back there on the main switcher. We've got Bill Frog running social media. 
Normally Jeremy Wynn, JW, he's running and helping, but tonight it's our own Sandy. And of course, everyone thinks she's prettier than JW anyway, so we love having her on board. Of course, myself, I get to play your comedic host who tries to keep his job and not get pink slips up here in front of you on camera. I do enjoy sharing all this wonderful information with you and bringing in the guests. And of course, tonight, our special guest on board, Brad Gans, who's actually our, one of our national, regional national sales managers, and Billy Temple from Base Wars. I think Billy and I are going to go to breakfast in the morning, have a conversation about who knows what. I think it'll be some fun. As always, thanks for tuning in. Have a great week. Have a safe weekend. And we will see you next Tuesday night, 730 Central Time, right here on the Kicker Facebook and YouTube channels. Love you guys. Have a good one. We'll see you then. Is it?